What's up? It's Dodie. And it's D. Kirks. And today is a great day because it's International Women's Day. Fitting because we have a very badass woman joining us today. She ran track and field at University of Oregon from 2004 to 2008 and then transferred to Florida State for her fifth year. Katie Leary, now steel, lettered four times each in cross country and track at Klamath Union High School. Qualified for the cross country meet four times and won an individual state championship as a senior. Her winning time of 18 minutes, three seconds, was the second fastest ever run at Lane Community College, the site of the state cross country championship. Later, she won the Oregon-Washington Border Clash and was captain of two championship teams. 2000, in 2005, as a redshirt freshman at the University of Oregon, she was second team all packed in thanks to her 13th place finish in the cross country conference championship, which is the top cross country conference in the nation. Fun fact, her husband, Adam Steele, won the NCAA championship in the 400 meters at the University of Minnesota in 2003, running a time of 44.57, which at the t- time was the fastest 400 meter time in the world later dubbed one of the greatest 400-meter races of all time. He went on to race professionally, and his attempt at the Olympics fell short with an injury in 2008. Katie had this Instagram post in 2019 that really captured our attention. Yeah, in that Instagram post, she talked about how she quit running at University of Oregon, and there was a coach that reached out to help her get back on her path. That coach was Alberto Salazar. And he connected her with a doctor, Dr. Jeffrey Brown, um, both of which are now uh, banned from United States track and field uh, due to some research by United States Anti-Doping Administration. And just completely mind-boggling story about how she took illegal performance enhancing drugs without knowing. And she didn't know until she found out in 2008 when she met with a fertility doctor. And then through that experience, uh, ended up building a career out of it, which is now in Bend, Oregon. Yeah, Thrive Mental Health Therapy in Bend, Oregon. It's a great story. So let's get into it. Let's do it. Katie, welcome to the pod. Thank you for having me. So excited for this conversation. Uh, I know you and Dee Kirks are super tight. Uh, He's been very excited to have you on and has shared so many stories. Uh, when we were actually brainstorming this, uh, you were probably one of the first names you brought up. And I was like, yes, let's do this. Um, so very excited. Um, but what really touched me when what Daniel told me uh, was the Instagram post that you had on October in 2019. So I'm going re- to read that. I'm going to read that real quick. Popcorn me. Test, testing Dodie's reading skills. <laughs> I need some clutch coffee for this. <laughs> So the post, again, this is 2019. I quit after another meeting with my college coach ending in tears. I told him I would finally throw in the towel. Within a couple of days of quitting, another coach reached out to help me. He laid out all of my options that would allow me to keep running. He connected me with other college coaches and doctors, all in effort, I thought, to get me back on my feet. He reignited my confidence. He encouraged me to follow my dreams and maximize my potential. As of Monday, that coach has been banned from USA track and field for four years for facilitating the use of illegal performance enhancement drugs. The doctor in Texas the coach referred me to and who oversaw my medical care for years is also banned. These two men helped restore my belief in myself. They helped me transfer universities while keeping my eligibility intact. They supported me while I hobbled around a new campus in a boot because I had injured most of my lower leg. Eight years later, athletics way in the past, I watched my fertility doctor thumb through hundreds of pages of medical charts. In our first meeting, he affirmed my health conditions weren't being treated completely accurately. It was disheartening. They were the experts. They believed in me. I trusted them. It still takes me to my knees when I connect with that period of my life. It really messed with my psyche. It remains a bit of mystery why they took me under their wing. The stumbling blocks in life often provide us the greatest opportunity for growth. It's at those junctures that we get to decide if we are going to allow those hard moments to define us 
or use them as an opportunity to dig in and find out what we are made of. We might not have control of all life's variables, but we certainly can control how we react to it. Yeah, it's so strange even hearing that. And it does in times feel like a minute ago and then other times like a lifetime ago. But the, hearing you even read that of like, it's visceral, right? It's just so interesting to me how it just lives in our being. Like I can feel my chest is tight. Like, oh, it's like constricted and just, just tight. Um, that anxiety bubbles up of like, all of a sudden you're right back there. And it's interesting because when I listened to the first podcast of your alls, I actually texted Dan because he was at U of O. We had met in high school, we're both at U of O and I texted him and it was so weird because I blocked out so much of that um, period of time. And listening to him and Kendra kind of chat about how they had first met, this wave came back and I remembered I had this vision of sitting in his apartment, like curled up in a ball on the chair, just like sobbing and he was, as he is such a kind soul, but it was interesting I'd forgotten that because there was, yeah, right? There wasn't a lot of nurturing and that was a space of just like complete comfort. Um, so it's nice to be able to remember that with those other periods of what you just read where it's just like sheer anxiety. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, but what stuck out to me in that post was the opportunity piece on how you can either grow from it um, or just kind of sulk in it. And to see you being a badass female um, now with your own practice and, and kind of what you're doing now is unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested to dive into your history of how you navigated, you know, athletics as a you know, female and what that was like of, I look back on that period of time and although could be triggering in an instant and I have a lot of sadness and resentment and anger um, that has ebbed and flowed. I mean, I took it on and I blamed myself at first and you know, it's been just such a journey. And I look back now and it's like, thank goodness it happened. You know, I, I, I feel like I've learned so much. I was forced to do work that who knows if I would have done it without that experience. Um, I think it, it connects me with humans in a different way of to, to have that vulnerability and that, that exposure and that betrayal at such a vulnerable stage of life. It, it was formative. I mean, it really, it was rough. I feel like I'm on the other side of it now and it can still take me right back. Um, and I can still get ignited in a second. Um, but it was, it was, it was pivotal for sure in terms of development and growth and, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's why I went into the field I went into. So you said you were in college. How old were you? So, ugh, I mean, I had, and this is where sharing this story is just so interesting because it's this, that fine line of, you know, I, I, I by no means was, you know, I was, a, I had a lot of support and my family was amazing. Um, but I look back on it now and it's like, I was, 18 going to school and my freshman year the college coach that had recruited me she the whole staff got fired um our after our cross first cross country season that I had redshirted and so our spring season so track they had this interim coach who was an amazing human he was an amazing human he filled in and then the next fall and the whole new coaching staff came in and they were they had come from Stanford um and I had a yeah probably my best season that fall despite a lot of turmoil um and after that like the wheels fell off the wagon like big time I mean big time and it was uh I was what are you 20 20 years sophomore 19, 19 year. yeah 1920 probably right around there yeah so you think back I mean like a baby in essence right and you're talking oh like God. money and power and that's just icky um and so struggled my from my sophomore track season through till the end until I finally decided to leave Oregon and um had an opportunity to well I quit like that post said I felt ultimately got to a place of like, I'm just done. Yeah, let's stop there. So yeah. 
you, you kind of just like scanned way over the whole big issue here is like, yeah. you know, and we'll give an overview in the intro of this pod. So you don't need to give a bit, but you as a sophomore red shirt freshman, I believe you were second team, all pack 10. And then sophomore year, you were injured. What was that injury? Was it related to the injury from high school? So the injury was, the injury was medical. So that's where the weirdest thing of, um, I would go to the coaches and I would say, I cannot find my fifth gear. And in running, like, that's what you need, right? You just need to like, be able to power through. And this is your sophomore sophomore year? This was my sophomore year. Okay. Yeah. And I would go to them and say, I can't find my fifth gear. I can't find my fifth gear. And they're like, sorry. I mean, at the end of the day, they didn't have a whole lot of loyal to me, loyalty to me. We did a preseason camp. Um, uh, we did a preseason camp that first year they came in and I sat down with the coach. We had done one race. They had given us a different race plan. And I said, Hey, you gave us a different race plan. You know, you told one of the gals to do something different and the rest of us to do something else. Is this how it's going to be? Cause maybe this isn't going to be the best fit for me. And they're like, no, no, no oh, no, we don't, that's not how it's going to be. So it wasn't really a match right from the get-go. I believe, and they told me this over time, I, they didn't like how my scholarship was administered. Um, They wanted it back, basically. (laughs) And so there was a little bit of a rub there. And, you know, a lot of the folks that I had come in who were in my class, like my, my roommate, Megan, who's still a dear friend, she was gone. She got cut from the team. She was gone. And so your people, you don't even have the support anymore. And so then spring season rolled around um, track season and I didn't feel good. I did. I felt flat. I felt um, I started gaining weight, which in the running world, you know, not a good thing. And my the previous season, I was the thinnest I had ever been and got quite a bit of praise for that had missed period cycles and told my coach, hey, I haven't had a period in a really long time. And they're like, great, that's awesome. That means your body fat is right where it needs to be, right? And so at 19, a baby, basically, you're like, okay, I, I mean, I, okay. Um, so started gaining weight. Uh, and I honestly, this is the part that's so weird. I don't really know what happened that season. So I don't, um, it was the end of that season. Then I started to say they weren't letting me come to practice. And I, I remember just sobbing. This is where I was in Dan's living room, just like a basket case because I couldn't go to practice. So you didn't have a sense of belonging. Those were people that I knew really. Um, and I was isolated from that and lonely and confused and felt ashamed. I mean, incredibly ashamed. Went to doctor appointment after doctor appointment, um, cross country season of my junior year same thing. Didn't feel good. I mean, gosh, you you all, I should have thought about this before thinking that we would kind of run through this because it is, it's weird. Like periods of it are kind of like, I don't, it all, it all merges together a little bit. Um, and ultimately I, I believe it was winter of my junior year. I went into the coach and I said, I'm done. I can't do this. I don't like how this is feeling. And he was so nice to me. Yeah. Cause he was happy. He was, he he got his scholarship back. He got his way. That's what he'd wanted. So in between there, yeah. Okay. In between there, were you like meeting with him consistently and talking to him about, so going back, like backtrack, you mentioned medical, you Mm -hmm. you never really diagnosed. I know what this is, but um, did you mention it to him and, and were there consistent conversations about what that exact medical injury was? Yes. Yeah, so medically I had, you know, everybody, every physician's favorite thing when their patient comes in, like I Googled this and I'm pretty sure this is what I have. And what I was pretty sure I had was polycystic ovarian syndrome. I met all the criteria aside from at the time I wasn't struggling with weight. And so Wait, what is that exactly? It's like a hormone imbalance. Okay. And so, um, and it was like periods would be irregular weight gain, you know, it, it just, I met every criteria. And so I went to the the coaching staff and said, Hey, I really think this is what's going on. And they said, you can find a doctor and do that. And so I, I found, well, my, my parents helped me find an endocrinologist. I went in and 
they said no and i don't think that's what it is but could never come up with anything so went back to the coaching staff kind of got entangled with the team doctors at that point in time no answers no real support it felt like no real support um but i was pretty confident like i knew something was going on right i didn't feel good it didn't feel like myself i um but i was alone and i nobody aside from friends um and family i was just kind of like pushed the side athletically which is you know i this is a conversation i want to have with you too dodi of like that's your identity right it's a it's your place of belonging that's all i knew that's why i was there that's what was i that's why i was motivated by and then i was just floundering and so um you know, it's it's strange. It's strange to look back on it now, but I would schedule meetings with the coaches and it was pretty rigid of the um, the assistant coach was pretty nice. And so I she would come to the meetings and she, but in the meetings, it was like she was just like not existent, like she wasn't an advocate for me. She wouldn't say anything. The coach was and I, I should have pulled out some journals and gone through some of the verbatim language. But I mean, it was cruel and devastating and i i can remember leaving his office many times just in tears of being asked to leave and we'll continue to pay for your school but you won't be able to run and you know how do you make sense of that at 19 20 years old that's so confusing and you're talking about your age so that's why that's kind of what i'm kind of stuck on right now is you're a teenager still yeah and you are committing to a school to compete at the highest, highest level at that age, mm -hmm. at the best track and field school in the country. And so you have all your trust instilled in the coaches, all your trust instilled in the doctors. I mean, as a kid, you don't know what you're doing. I mean, it's the first time, like even probably for your parents, like having oh. a kid be at that level, you go yeah. in and you, and you trust somebody so much. Yeah. And then they're not listening to you or they're saying, oh, no, you're going to do this and do that. I mean, mm -hmm. to your point, it's an identity crisis type thing, which I kind of went through, too, when after, during my injury. And you're like, what am I doing here? Like, yeah. how can I compete? Questions go. And then it becomes more of like not only a physical thing, but then a mental thing, too, which we want to tap into. But before that, I wanted to go back to your high. Daniel mentioned your high school injury. Can you go into a little bit about that? Yeah, I had this like, um, it was RSV. So this like really weird nerve damage in my foot from a contact wound, um, which is was totally unrelated. So that was just like a fluke injury. I was doing yoga, something fell on it. My foot like got swollen, like couldn't put it in a shoe. Oh, wow. um, and so did a bunch of PT and uh, I had to get some nerve blocks in my back um to get it to basically like to, it was like super sensate like extra sensation really strange but that was a total fluke total different okay total fluke this you know was healthy going into college and um yeah it just it got icky and power and money just makes my skin crawl. I mean, now it's like this thing that can just like make my, like, I feel it right now. Like my blood is probably boiling. Um, mine is, mine is too, actually. Like, I want you to know, like, I, I feel like, pretty fresh. Here. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I want to get into like the weeds of this. Like yeah. we're, we're kind of dancing around the issue. That coach was Vin, right. Came from yeah. Stanford. Uh, yeah well-known coach in the track and field industry. I mean, born to run talks about him when he was at Stanford for all those uh, listeners. Um, so you told him you quit. Yep. You're then what, you then what I happened? Told him, I told him I quit and he was super nice. He was like super nice. My parents really weren't on board. Uh, my mom said, and my mom is like, go get him, tiger. So she like did not agree with like, I can't believe you're letting this man have this power over you. That's not who you are. Um, you can do better. You love this. You deserve this. You have earned your love. Like, you can't let them take this away from you. And it wasn't that easy. I mean, she was super well intentioned, but it wasn't that easy. And so I basically made the decision on my own. Like, I can't do this. It's not good for my well being. I had found a degree that I, you know, thought I was finally after four, you know, different majors that I was like, okay, I think this might be my thing. Um, and so I made the decision. I went into his office, told him I quit. 
within a week's time, he was great. Like he was so nice, like have, has never been that nice to me, which is just like gag worthy, right? Of like, <laughs> Ugh, come on, buddy. Um, and had a week that was like pretty lovely. It felt like a huge weight had been lifted. And within that week, Alberto Salazar called me and he said, why are you quitting? What are you doing? And I said, I, I, I don't, I'm not, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's happened, but I'm miserable. And he kind of swooped in like this, like wonder man. Like it was like magical almost of like, I'm going to, I'm going to send you to these doctors. You can come run here. What do you want? We're going to make that opportunity, like come to fruition for you. So this like inside of me is just like ignited, right? Of like, what an amazing gift that he's giving me. Like how kind of a soul he must be to really be like going to bat for me. He sees me, he gets it. Um, finally, like after a few years of nobody, like fully understanding me as a human, like, I feel like he's really getting me. So I go back to Vin and I say, Vin, I'm going to explore other opportunities. And he goes, no, you're not. You quit. You relinquished your eligibility. You're no longer eligible to compete at the NCAA. What? Wait, what? Yeah, right? Like, what? I have no idea, right? Again, 19 years old, 20 years old. Wait, so because you said you quit means you can't transfer, but if you went into them and said, I want to transfer, you keep your eligibility? I mean, right? Like this is like the politics of college athletics, right? Of yeah. like, we're talking youth athletics here. Yeah, it's, it should just be like an opportunity. It's not amateurism. It's definitely professional. Like this is what Jay Billis talks about all the time. Like college sports, like I love them. I love to support them. It's not amateurism. It is professional. Okay. So that anyways. Yeah. Yeah. And it's icky. It's like, you're confused. I don't know the NCAA regulations, right? I don't know. I haven't, I don't know what. So I I'm like, Oh, I didn't. I, well, what do we do here? So Alberto once again, is like, Oh no, 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 no. You can do this. You can do what it is that you want. And to me, I'm like, thank you. Finally an advocate. And we go back and forth and he's like, nope, you can't. I won't let you transfer. If you transfer anywhere, you're at a minimum going to lose one year eligibility. If you even try to transfer within the, it was the pack 10 at the time, um, you'll lose two if you even can get in. And so, okay. I, I mean, so kind of explore this. We do all these back and forths and he's adamant that I can't transfer Alberto, meanwhile, I'm like on a plane to Texas going to this doctor, Dr. Brown in Houston, trying to figure out like medically what's going on. I yeah, mean, honestly, you're still, having that, you're still having that stuff going on. It's not like it just been yeah. after you quit, right? No, I still feel horrible. Um, it's really funny sharing the story because it really kind of feels like a dream of like, oh, this is it. it I mean, I guess this did happen. Um, so go on a flight to Texas, get there, get my blood work done again, this doctor, there's like a huge, it's funny. My mom was just here over the weekend. And so Adam and my mom and I were kind of talking about this. And so my mom flew with me to Texas. It's like a huge storm, like a Southern storm. So the power's out, the power goes out. So this doctor likes brings us into this, we're staying in a hotel. He brings us into this office and we're thinking like, oh, it's going to be this like nice establishment. He like brings us into these like back file rooms and is like drawing my blood of, you know, and he was a nice guy, like super curious. He did all of it himself. We didn't see anybody else, just him. Um, and he's like, something's wrong with your thyroid. You have a, th your thyroid is off. And we're like, oh my gosh, an answer. This is so awesome. <laughs> Finally, there's like a reason why this is happening immediately starts being on medication. And I'm like, okay, like maybe I feel better. Um, and go back to Oregon um, and end up, I can't even really remember how it happened, but Alberto put me, the options were I could go to Portland and run with Alberto's team, which I believe at the time was the Oregon project still, or he'd help me transfer. And at the time, like, I kind of thank my lucky stars that this was my instinct um, because I think the story could have looked very different. Um, I wanted to be a part of a team. I wanted to go back to college. And so I, he put me in touch with some coaches. I talked to the coaches and I chose Florida State. And so I chose that 
my parents came up, we sat down in this like boardroom with Vin and like a bunch of his like people and one of them being the assistant coach. And it was just this like icky meeting. And I can still picture sitting there with my parents who hadn't really encountered Vin in the capacity that like I had been describing them to him to them for months now, right? Like over a year. And he is an ass. I mean, he was just like, um, an ego, uh, such a big ego. Like that's even when he said like, you can never speak of this to anybody. And afterwards my parents were like, who's gonna care? Like <laughs> care that like this like, like speak, speak runner who hasn't been doing well, like wants to transfer schools cause she likes to run, right? Like who cares? Anyway, so he decides at that moment, he's like, okay, you, you can, since you're transferring conferences, we'll, we'll give you your eligibility. But that was the stipulation of like, but you can't talk. So I was able to transfer schools. I was on this like fresh new thyroid med, like in touch with Alberto still. He's overseeing my medical care, working with this Dr. Brown in Texas. Um, I finish, I'm no longer doing anything with athletics through Oregon and finish that term go home for the summer and train and get, you know, at the time, like pretty fit because I mean, what happens when we're numbing our emotions? We overcompensate in other ways. And I did that. I was gonna overtrain because it numbed everything else that had just happened. Um, and so I, I had, I had picked Florida State. I guess this is an important piece. I had picked Florida State because all the feedback I had been given was um, why people didn't like the program is because the coach was too soft. And I was like, that is just, that, great. that is just what I need. Like, I, that I do not think I'm going to be professional. I just really want to run for whatever reason, right? Like that was just such a tug for me. Well, that summer I get a call from his name was coach Brayman and he goes, Hey, Katie. So we're, uh, we're, we're restructuring the program. And I'm like, okay, like, cool. Like, so this like puppy dog, right. Of like, awesome. I'm, I'm like so excited still. He's like, we're restructuring it. We're bringing in this new coach. She's going to be the head women's coach and I'm going to oversee the men. But, 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 but I really wanted you to know, because I know what you've just been through. Um, and so I want you to know, like, I'm still going to like be like overseeing your training. Like I'll give you all your training this weekend, all over through the summer. Um, he's like, I still really want to like keep the reins on you. Um, because the guy was like a kind human, mm -hmm. right. And so like, you've had all this like emotional scarring, like you need some nurturing. So I was like, that's no problem. Totally cool. Right. Like eternal optimist coming out. Um, and so, and the, the plan was going into it as he was going to get me a medical redshirt year. So he was going to get a back some eligibility. I had another year of eligibility and then some, I was going to have three years left. So the plan was like, you're going to get your undergraduate degree and then you'll go to grad school at least for a year. So great. This is going to be like a big endeavor. Get off the plane in August with my parents in Tallahassee. And we're like, <gasps> it's so humid. You can't even breathe. Um, and this new coach, Karen Harvey was, um, oh. just so sad. It was such, it was such a bummer. And so I did, and she didn't want to keep the reins on. Um, she wanted to, you know, you need to like live up to like why you're here. Um, That's what she was tough. She was tough. She was not Coach Brayman, who was going to be like the warm, fuzzy, like fatherly, like just I'll take you under my wing. And um, so I uh, I ended up ultimately like running in spikes. I tore every tendon and ligament in my ankle and had three stress fractures. Partially like to my own doing of like, I was, I wasn't going to pump my own brakes. Like that's what I wanted to be doing, but I wasn't ready. I mean, I had, you know, training had been on my own for the last year in essence, when I was kind of training on my own at Oregon, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for that mileage. My spirit was certainly not ready for that mileage. And, you know, I've become a huge believer in the mind body connection, like our body. I don't have you all read the body keeps the score. No. Okay. Add no. it to your list. Okay. 
Alchemist, amazing book. Um, basically, in essence, like our body holds on to what our mind isn't willing to process yet. And so it's going to come up and we have to, we have to be doing that work. So Which I hadn't, obviously. Katie, I, I want to, you, you did a great job telling your story here. I want to jump back to, you mentioned Alberto. <clears throat> Our listeners are going to find this part really interesting. Um, I know he was connected to a teammate on the men's side of Oregon. Mm -hmm. Leave that alone. How did you get in contact with Alberto? You said he called you. How, I mean, did he just find your phone number and call you? I, you know, that's a good question, Dan. I, he called me. Yeah. He called me. I can still remember, you know, my flip phone talking to him and I can picture my room with like, he was, he was so, um, he was so supportive. He was really present and attentive and, um, he seemed like he really cared and I took him at face value. And so did my parents. I mean, honestly, so did my parents and he would call my parents and he remains kind of a, a, a player in my life for a few years post-graduation. I mean, I went to Florida state and got injured and I, yeah, I got injured. He continued to draw my blood and, um, he was kind. And up till that point, the narrative for me was, he's the guy. I mean, thank goodness for him. Like he dug me out of the trenches. Yeah. Um, and it really wasn't until I was like 28 that that narrative did a 180. Um, yeah. we'll get there, we'll but get there. He, yeah, he was, he, I, he must have, I mean, we, I was classmates with the, you know, the guy he was coaching and was friends with those folks. So I would imagine he got it from them. I don't know. Yeah. So, my phone so you went to Texas and you went to the doctor that is Dr. Jeffrey Brown. Yep. And what, what I find really interesting is we've, I think at this point, we've all seen the Netflix documentary Icarus, right? Oh, yeah. Dodie, you seen Icarus? Nope. Oh, uh, yeah. We should have. I should have had you watch that before this oh my God. conversation. Oh, D. Kirk. So, <laughs> how do you spell that? I'll, 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 we'll, we'll ping it in the show notes. So, um, basically, like th this guy wants to become a professional cyclist, and he gets in contact with a medical doctor that oversees the Russian Olympics uh, medical history. His name's Gregory Rachinkov. Yeah, I got. The, I think Gregory Rachinkov, and he. Right. And he basically <laughs> teaches you how they doped their athletes on this. So you were the parallels between that you're going in this back room of this kind of file cabinet area of this office in Texas, but they fixed it like they fixed what was wrong right because you felt better after you saw these doctors. I mean, so that's how this story ends up unfolding. It's like, I got treated for a thyroid disorder I didn't have. Yeah, Come so, to find hang on, hang on. I, I'm, I want to get to this, Dodie, hang but on. I also want to know like, okay, so you go I know. check this, you go to the doctor, you do all these, these tests and stuff too, and then you go to Florida State. So you're feeling better? Because you feel so good to run and I get injured. So I probably, yeah, I, and I get there and I'm feeling, I mean, gosh, it's hard to know now. And I wish I could go back in time of like, was I feeling better? Because all the emotional shit just comes up again, right? I'm in a boot. I'm like nine months in a boot. I don't know anybody. I fortunately had like these saints of roommates who are still dear friends because they, I don't know, honestly, what I would have done without the two of them. Um, and I mean, again, run into... I, Alberto had gotten me a full ride scholarship. I'm certain of it now. And so... I am standing in the infield of this track and Karen Harvey comes up like this close to my face and she goes, you are the biggest waste of money we have ever had. <laughs> I'm like, oh, like 21 years old, like I could cry. And Adam and I had, who's my husband had just started dating and I remember calling him and I'm like, it just doesn't make sense. Like, what am I doing wrong? Like I'm pissing off all these people. Um, and all I want to do is run. Like, all I wanted to do is run. Like, I don't want to be in a boot. This is miserable. Um, so, so I end up going into this. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, you were on that. I was going to come back to the thyroid, but keep going. Yeah. I go into the dean's office. I had transferred from Oregon. You all, this is a really long story. So you can cut me off at any point. 
I go into this dean's office. I had transferred from quarters to semesters, which basically means like the quarter transfer isn't the same. And I go and I'm like, I have got to get out of here. I just like need to be done. And he looks at my transcripts. And he's like, whoa, you've done a little bit of everything. I was like, okay, I don't care. Like, what do I need to do to get out of here? And he's like, okay, punches some numbers. And he's like, we can get you out. We can get you out if you do a short summer term. And I'm like, anything, anything. And he's like, you're 0.3 uh, credits off of each class because of how they transfer. And he's like, I'm going to just wave it and I'm going to round them up. And like, I could drop to my knees and like praise that man because what he did was huge. And I look back on that of like, I'm pretty sure that is the moment in time that like I learned how to hustle because it's like, okay, this, I have got to learn how to navigate systems. I have got to get myself out of here. I am going to be my best advocate. So I end up graduating um, that whatever summer, first uh, summer term. And I am like a sad little puppy dog of like, who am I? What am I doing? I had just started dating Adam, who was also a runner. Um, and I moved back to Eugene, which was like exposure therapy when I look back on it now. And Adam was, um, he's six years older. So he was running professionally. And so he had like a bigger, a bigger view of like the whole scene. And he pointed out right from the get-go of like, do you think it's weird? Like, you're not doing anything. Why are Dr. Brown and Alberto continually calling you for blood draws? And I'm like, I don't know, like, they really care about me. Like, they're the ones that really care about my health. And so they are like, they're really like, just looking out for me. And so I go how, and I how do- many, How many years after you stopped running? Jeez, they would contact me for probably like three years post-competing. Wow. And so I, like my mom reminded me, she said one time they called my mom and they're like, Hey, I'm taking this other kid's blood. I need her to get in immediately. So I can also take it with me to this lab in like Canada. And my mom's like, okay, cool. Sure. That, sounds, that sounds great. Literally like we're so oblivious that this is I even mean, Canada's weird, right? great. Who doesn't like Canada? <laughs> right? Why wouldn't you want your blood going to Canada? I mean, yeah. Um, so this is like years, I'm like irrelevant, right? Like never competed. I'm like really just like they're in this for like my best interest. So I continue to take the thyroid medicine. I then at 28 years old, that's when I sit down with this fertility doctor. And they like, I mean, I must have trickled off of them like calling and asking for me to go and like do blood work and things of that nature. I had a different primary care doc, obviously at that point in time. Um, and I felt like I had the answers. I felt like I had gotten the answers I needed for my health. Um, and sitting in this fertility doctor's office and the man is a genius. He's like sitting with like this like huge medical chart and he's like saying all this stuff to the, the point where at one point Adam looks at me and he goes, well, you haven't shared any of this. I was like, I didn't remember it. Like I didn't remember the stuff he was sharing and he goes, you never had a thyroid issue. And in fact, the way that they tested your thyroid was illegal. That's not a, that's not a legal means of how to test for the antibodies in a thyroid. We can't draw that test as medical providers. And I was like, what, what? So he tried to take me off the thyroid medicine and he's like, it might work because this isn't what was going on with you. And at that point he affirms that that polycystic ovarian syndrome that I went to that very first doctor saying, I'm pretty sure this is what's going on. He was like, that's what's going on. Um, he's like, you never had a thyroid condition, but you've been medicated now for numerous, numerous years. Your body's probably become reliant on it, but let's try it. Let's see if we can get you off of it. Um, and we couldn't, we've tried a handful of times and I'm now on it and didn't need to be. And so needless to say, this is the point in time when it's like, you think you've like closed a chapter, right? Of like, okay, college athletics was college athletics and it's closed and it just has this place on the shelf and that's just what it is. And it's all ripped wide open again at 28 years old, right? Of like, what is, like, what is my, what, it, what happened? Where? I, these were the guys who were helping me, who cared about me. And now that narrative is flipped and what, what's happening with my health. And at that point, that's all I cared about. Like, sure. I'm running like recreationally, but like, 
a very, you know, like not the identity component of it anymore and trying to now figure out if like medically what's going on with me. I want to have kids and now this is a barrier to that. And um, so then I started the processing all over again of like Alberto and um, of Dr. Brown, like what was their, what was their shtick? Yeah. So in 2019, they got banned from United States track and field through basically a bunch of research that uh, United States uh, Anti-Doping Association got involved in. Mm -hmm. And um, gosh, who was it? Kara Goucher yep. came out publicly and very publicly accused them of illegally administering thyroid medication to mm -hmm. her. And Kara Goucher's like probably one of the most famous 10,000 meter runners the United States ever had two-time Olympian uh mm -hmm. national champ um yeah did during this did you mention anything to anybody so you know what is this is and this is the part that still honestly just makes me kind of sad is I have tried to get in contact with everybody from like a sense of like you know what I'd like to see those dudes raked over the coals because I feel like they've mistreated so many people um, I feel like power, money, all of that just covered up so much shit. Um, and I've tried to get in touch with everybody from an advocacy perspective. Um, I've also tried to get in touch with people of like, I want to know my health history. I want to understand my medical conditions. I want to understand what I was being treated for and why I was manipulated by these people, right? Of like, really believing that they were helping me like i i am so curious i would i would embrace any conversation and have tried to get in touch with anybody who would know anything and have gotten nothing yeah like the why the why me like why did they choose you yeah like well why you're, did a, reach out you're to a test number? subject you had an issue that literally they thought that their system could could be successful with and that's why they've continued to use you until you're past your running days they wanted to see how it you know worked in your body right mm -hmm. i mean that's my hypothesis right they had to be testing something to see and i don't know that's what i want to know like what why and why didn't you just tell me why didn't you let me consent to like do i want to play this game with you and i maybe i would have i hope not but like i certainly know i didn't consent to what was happening yeah i say that that was okay I didn't I was I was misled to what was happening uh, in a pretty vulnerable stage of life anyway right of like I was floundering and that to me is just really heartbreaking of so at 28 you meet with this genius fertility doctor he mm -hmm. tells you that you are taking illegal performance enhancing drugs what does that feel like Oh, I mean, I, I'm literally shaking. It's weird because like, this isn't my day-to-day -day life anymore, um, but it doesn't go away, right? Like it is, it's, it's, it is still a piece of who I am. And I feel like I haven't done my due diligence to making it be okay for other people. I think that's the part where I get a little stuck of this isn't, I, I'm not unique. I mean, I experienced like a micro dose of what a lot of other people have experienced. And that is just fucked up. That is not okay. And so, I mean, if there's anything I can do in my life to prevent that for other people, it, it, it infuriates me. I mean, I literally feel it through my whole body right now of like, that is, that isn't okay. What do we do? The system is broken. How do we fix the system? How do we protect other people who are vulnerable and driven and babies in essence, right? Who are, um, you know, it, it's, this is, this is maybe my scenario with it, but it looks 8 million different ways. Um, and that none of them are okay. And, you know, the funding that was behind those programs infuriates me. Um, you know, there's people like Mary Kane and, you know, a lot of people have come out about the, the treatment and it's like, you, you, you hope it stops. And I don't know, Dodie, did you experience any of that in your, what was it like for you? 
I was very fortunate. I had an awesome surgeon at UConn, uh, my coaching staff. And yeah, I went through the identity crisis. I went through the like, what's going on? I tore my ACL three times. Like something's got to be wrong. But mm -hmm. um, you keep mentioning like the, the community and, and the group. I just had a great support staff and I got lucky because mm -hmm. they were with me from the beginning and they were really, truly trying to find what was, mm -hmm. what was wrong and worked with me and that kept me going. And yeah, I wanted to transfer at one point, but I sat mm -hmm. down with the coaches and they're like, listen, like, I know it's tough, but what can we do to help? And it, I was very, very fortunate with my family, with my teammates, with my coaches, with my doctors, with my athletic trainer. Like I, I'm still really, really close with them. So, oh, yeah. I mean, it breaks my heart to hear your story because I mean, I can relate from the injury side, but I can't relate from the not knowing where to go and trusting trusting somebody and then having it turn out to be this way. Yeah. I mean, it warms my heart to hear your story, right? Because that's the experience you want people to have. And I, you know, I took so much of it on of like, this must be me. I must be the one, like I am this common denominator. And it took a lot of work of like this, the system is failing a lot of people. Fortunately, not all of them, right? It's we need to hear stories like yours and those coaches and that, that, that training staff and those teammates, they deserve to be bowed down to because that is the experience that, that adolescents deserve to have when participating in college athletics. Well, and that's the thing too. It's like, especially because, so what year would you say this all went down? Um, I started college in 2004, 2004 to 2008. So do you think that, and there, it's not like you have the access to an iPhone where you can just like connect with a community of some sort on your iPhone. It's just like, I didn't have my first iPhone, I think until I was a sophomore or junior in college, mm -hmm. which was in 2010 and 11, maybe where mm -hmm. it's like, you didn't have that information at your fingertips. So you had to rely and trust on the people around you. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think it would be different if you had that experience uh, now in today's age? Mm. That's an interesting question. I haven't, I haven't thought about that. Um, you know, connections hard to replicate, right? Of, yeah, I think any way you can get connection, whether that's through, you know, more accessibility with the device and virtual components. Um, I have an amazing family and really good friends. Um, but there was a relatability factor of like teammates, right? Of like you see your teammates mm. going and doing something else and, um, and the coaching staff, it's like, that's, that's where you want, that's where I wanted that place of belonging. And I just wasn't, I wasn't in that. I wasn't, I wasn't getting that. Um, yeah, yeah. And I, I think that's a good question to kind of even ponder of that can be one of the access points that makes it different, different for college students going through it now of, you know, how do we go into that with more value of self? And, you know, would that have made, you know, I can't put my 35 year old brain in my 20 year old experience, right? Of like, um, I wish I, I wish I could, cause I think I'm 31 and I still, I'm like, wait, what, 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 what actually happened? So yeah, I feel, yeah. I feel you on that one, but yeah, no, I was just curious with that too, because like, it's the, oh, it's always like the thought of two of like, oh, let me get a second opinion or let me get a third opinion. Mm -hmm. But trust and loyalty was such a big thing growing up. I mean, for me oh. too, where it's like, oh, they have my best interest in mind. Of course, why wouldn't yeah. they? Yep. And now like everything starts coming out more. You're like, I should probably question a lot more. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, you don't want to lose that, right? I mean, that's part of what you want to yeah. see humans be able to preserve is like, how do we trust and connect and uh, remain loyal of like, <laughs> not always looking our, over our shoulder of like, is somebody going to try to screw me over of like, that ended up being the ending of that unfortunate story. But it also, you know, there were, I mean, between the hustle and the grit and the, you know, intrinsic work that occurred from it, like it ended up working out for, but I feel lucky that it ended up working out of like, you, you think about the gym, gymnasts, what they experienced of like, wow. Yeah. What? Yeah. I mean, drama. Yeah. This, I, I think this is a good segue into how... I have one more question. Go ahead. Are you, yeah. you're not still taking the thyroid medicines, are you? Because you mentioned you tried to wean off, but you couldn't. You I'm, still still I'm still taking it. And we've tried a couple of times. We tried, and you know, it's, it's interesting because the wound is there, right? It's like you put the stitches in it and 
we had to do fertility treatment, which is a journey all of its own. And so, um, because of my health conditions. And so that's what Dr. Austin, the doctor, um, the fertility doctor, he was, you know, okay, let's just get you back to your baseline. But I, because my body had become reliant on the thyroid medication after eight years of being on it, we couldn't come off of it. So then even tried, um, when we were doing IVF after it failed one round, he's like, let's try it again. Let's try having you come off of it again. And same thing, like my levels just went all wonky. And so now I'm on it. And now I've kind of accepted, like, I'm going to be on it. I'm resentful if, you know, I'm being honest of like, I, I feel, I feel hurt by the fact that I don't have clarity as to why, but I'll be on it probably forever. And does that, would that affect you having kids? So we have three kids. Oh, but we, perfect. Good. Just yeah, for the listeners to know. Like, that has a you're like, you got to be kidding me. Okay, good. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And we did for three kids. Control. Good. Okay. Yeah. I can breathe now. Good, good, good. Yeah. yeah. I should have um, done more research before, but I'm so yeah. <laughs> No. Yeah. This is tense, right? Okay. Yeah. So, it's the fertility doctor. You can't. Oh, my goodness. Anyway. Okay. Daniel, Katie, sorry. you mentioned about like doing all the work. Um, the hustle, the grit, you feel lucky because, you know, you're not one of the gymnasts that happen to be in, involved in that at Michigan State. How has this process shaped you and what you do now as a mental health therapist? Mm -hmm. I think 100%. I think it's why I went into the line of work. I think, you know, it's such a privilege to be able to hold space for people in session and have them have a place of belonging and have somebody who's going to hear them and believe them um, and be curious. Um, I, I, when I went into the field, I was, I was focused on working with teenage athletes because, you know, that's what I probably needed. Um, and since my, my focus has probably morphed, I still am really motivated by that because I believe in prevention. And I think that's a, a good prevention access point is female athletes who are, you know, there's a, there's a drive and a focus and a, I mean, some of it, like the writing was on the wall, right. Of, I mean, that overdrive that I didn't, I didn't have that skill set to like really rein myself in and notice what I was feeling and tend to that. It was like mind over matter was the world I lived in. Um, which I've since learned just isn't that effective in day-to-day -day living. It's great for athletics some of the time, but I believe I would have been a better athlete had I paid more attention. So you mentioned Adam. He was running professionally back in Eugene. Mm -hmm. Did you ever run back into your former coach at U of O during any of that process of of Adam and what did that look like yeah you know what I uh I like avoided it Adam would want to go to track meets and I wouldn't go because I didn't want to see anybody but what I wouldn't give to run into them now I would I would fly to Virginia to cross paths <laughs> with him have a conversation um but at the time I wasn't ready I wasn't ready to I wasn't ready to run into him. I wasn't ready to run into my old teammates. I wasn't ready to see anybody from that chapter of my life because I hadn't made sense of it. What was that timeline like? I moved back to Eugene right after graduating in 2008. So wow. a year later, I was only in Florida for a year. Wow. Um, and so there was no running at all? Nope. I don't so think if you, so. If you were to run into him now, what would you say? Oh, you know, it's interesting. So I've I've composed many letters to all of these people, and I have sent them. You did. Uh, I've sent them, and and at various stages of my processing. So they have probably I don't know. Maybe they didn't get them. I never heard from anybody. Um, so I've I've sent the letters, um, and you know. A, a part of me, like it, my focus now on my focus on Vin got eclipsed by Alberto and Dr. Brown, you know, so that Vin was such a sting. And then Alberto and Dr. Brown just like kind of blew it all up. Mm. Um, 
so what I would say to them now would not probably be, um, would not, I, I would hope I would have tact because I would want to connect to the intent. Um, I would want to connect with the intent of like wanting to help other people. Um, but what I'd really want to say to them is like, I believe they all covered it up. Honestly, I believe everybody knew and nobody gave a shit and they were funded by a lot of money that covered up a lot of damage that occurred. And so I would probably put a couple F bombs in there of, um, exactly how I felt, uh, because I, I think there needs to be, um, accountability. I have a serious bone that I would like to pick with any of them at any point in time. Hopefully, you know, it could be tactful, but also like, when are people actually ever held accountable? In, in that world, never. I mean, that's, no. that's what's great about the whole Icarus deal, right? Is that like, he exposed this world of, of illegal performance enhancing drugs and like what the Russians did. And it was like, this is what happened. This is what I did. And mm. um, yeah, yeah. It's just a sad, sad day that it's, ha it's happening and it's being allowed to happen. And I'm sure it's happening in a lot more spaces than we really think. Oh, 100%. And that's just the chilling reality of like, how does that shift? It's just, it's people's lives, right? It's, it's, athletics are great until it damages humans. Yeah. You know, 100%. And, so yeah. will, will your kids run in college? Oh gosh. Will they? In how college? fast are your kids going to be at, we'll give a bio in the intro, but like you have Mr. Speed, Adam Steele, Katie Leary, who's, the, I mean, these kids are going to be fast. Teach them how to play golf. Or, oh, well, you <laughs> can teach how to play golf. Can you teach them? Yeah, love to. Okay, come teach all of us. Come stay with us this summer. We can do a big golf outing, all of us. Wouldn't that be fun? My best friend yeah, lives like a quarter mile away from Katie and, <laughs> and Ben. So, and they're, oh, is there an they're friends. Is there spare too. room? Or I can even catch. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there's spare rooms count me in so it would be so fun all right let's hey let's uh but that's a good segue into your uh your question daniel yeah katie i'm sure you've heard the pod before this is an interesting question because why is why is golf the greatest game on earth wow you know what i was wondering if you were going to ask me this we're going to ask everybody um oh, you have spoiled it for everybody else <laughs> only played once I need a lesson. I need to learn why, why is it? You two enlighten me. Why is golf the greatest game on earth? Dodie, it's International Women's Day. I'll let you go first. <laughs> oh my God, you found your manners. You're learning, I'm rubbing off on you. I think golf is the second greatest sport on earth because basketball is clearly the best as mm -hmm. UConn women's basketball just won uh, the Big East tournament uh, today. But anyway. Um, okay. Yeah. And, but golf is just great because it's such a mind game and we're like every single stroke matters, no matter mm -hmm. how you hit. So you really have to stay focused and 18 holes is a long time to stay mm -hmm. focused, to know mm -hmm. like if the ball, if you shank it right, if you put it long, it's kind of like, okay, what did I do to adjust? And I love being a basketball player and a shooter. It's such a mind game too. Um, mm -hmm. and adjusting it. That's why I think it's the best sport ever, or second best sport ever. That is a you long know? time to stay on. It yeah. is, and it's exhausting. It's funny. All my friends uh, that have listened to this now like ping me and ask me because some are golfers, some aren't. Obviously, I grew up as like a basketball dominant human, um, and I've played competitive basketball until. I mean, February 2020, I was in Spokane playing in a, a national or a regional basketball tournament. So, but okay. golf to me yeah, really nice. isn't about like the competition. It's not about being mentally on. Um, I think for me, it's a lot more about just being outside and like being internal and like feeling everything that's around you and enjoying the company. Um, it's really not the game um, because it's you, right? Like, the court isn't always the same on the golf course it's 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 how you hit the ball and mm -hmm. i think i think because of that um that's why i've like fallen in love with the game more as an adult and i could i could tell you each day like i i, I fall more in love with it um 
people I meet, the conversations, the places I go. Yeah, there's some stuck up aspects to it, some snootiness. Um, but hopefully we could break those barriers over time. And, Not you, uh, Daniel. Yeah, I know. Just the so, others. <laughs> so thanks for flipping that. That's the first person that's ever flipped it. Oh my gosh. Well, I can't wait for the golf weekend that we're going to have. Yeah, it's no, been, I'm, I'm in. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be, right? I'll be, I'll be vaccinated so in a little bit. So before we jump into some competitive banter, Katie, where can people find you on the interwebs? How can they interact with you? Yeah, so I mean, I'm like pretty poor at social media. I try to do it through our work page just because I really believe um, my hope, my hope for the field of mental health is to see the stigma just get extracted, right? Where it's accessible and it's normalized and it's utilized preventatively so that we're not waiting eons before accessing care. Um, so I really believe in the social media platform just because it's something that we do day to day. Um, with that said, it is oftentimes something that kind of falls off my radar, um, but I try to use it. Um, I think you and, do a great job. Oh, you're so kind. All your I, videos? Um, I mean, you got a lot of good content on there. Anyway, so what, what is that? Give yourself a plug right here. What is that? Thrive Mental Health Therapy. And yeah, we're based in Bend and we have, I mean, I adore the people that I get to work with. We've been really lucky at the team that's come together. Feels like a little family. Yeah, we'll link that in our show notes. So hopefully people reach out and tell you about how awesome your story is when, uh, when we share this. Hopefully we get some people on the East Coast that reach out and are like, oh, Bend, Oregon, never heard of it. But Katie, your story was awesome. <laughs> um, that tiny little dot on that map. Let's uh, let's jump into some competitive banter. Katie, you've listened oh. to the pod. You know how this works. Um, International Women's Day. Katie, you're going to go first. Dodie second. Oh. I'll go third and fourth, and then we'll circle back um, on a pod that dropped earlier. I skipped Dodie, so I got to apologize publicly. So I, get two, I get an extra one, right? No, that's not uh -huh. um, <laughs> So today we're going to uh, do best rom-coms all time. So Katie, what do you got? Let's banter. Okay. So this is something that I've been trying to get all of my friends to chat with me about. And everybody is like, not interested. So it's not a movie. So I'll give the disclaimer, Firefly Lane. Have either of you watched it on Netflix? Yep. <gasps> Thank you. What did you think? I thought it was awesome. I thought it was so super cute. I thought it, I love the best friends. This is your first thing. pick overall in the yeah, rom-com draft. I am like, sorry. It was good, but I wouldn't say it's number one. <laughs> okay. I mean, number one in the sense of like, it's like right here in front of my face. It's most present. And oh, I've been trying yeah. to get all my friends to watch it and nobody will. And everybody just is like, you should definitely watch Ted Lasso instead. And I'm like, the Firefly Lane. Will anybody talk to me about it? So I'll talk that's good. I like time, that. We'll Last was also really good. Uh, yeah, it that's is. Not, that's not a rom com, though. No. No, but Dan. I would highly recommend Firefly Lane. Yeah, I wrote it down. It's wrote a good one. Such a rom com guy. My number one overall is Pretty Woman. See, oh. that's that's a number one overall pick. <laughs> I beg your pardon. That is a good one. Maybe even I, worth watching. Yeah, the big mistake. Huge mistake. I say that all the time. You know, what? she walks in and yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, do we need to banter about that? That's that's a good pick. Probably not. That. It's the best got, one ever. I got that written down. All right. No, the best one ever. And we briefly mentioned this. I I watch this thing once every two weeks. Uh, I coached basketball at Mall High School right out of college, and just how I don't know when it even came out. It's probably right then. But all the kids call me Kirkers, which is the main character in this show. She's out of my league, which is the story of my dating life. Have you oh, never I seen knew that? She's out of my oh, wait, league. Wait, like, wait, wait, let's go back. Let's go back. You just said it's the story of her dating life. Why? Well, it's just funny. She's out of my league. I don't know. It's not the truth, but um, <laughs> I mean, how funny that's, that's that movie. Like the entire thing is completely quotable. Like Molly Mcleish, like everything is just insanely quotable. I do okay, think I've that is a great. Oh. You've never seen it? Oh my gosh. I've never seen it. Daniel has it on VHS, DVD, Blu-ray, <laughs> and everything. I, it's, I think it's on Prime Video. You might have to pay for it. I'm not quite sure. Um, it sounds like you it, though. 
Oh, it's it's funny. It it's like an it hour funny. and a half of just pure like quotable quote. Yeah, it's yeah. It's like awkward. It kind of makes you feel uncomfortable a little bit, but then it's like really funny. Certain parts, yeah. I mean, the guy's a nerd TSA agent that uh, the female character Molly McLeish like walks through TSA and forgets her phone, and they connect, and he's like a six, and she's a hard ten, and they they give he's like. A- three <laughs> they give they give a rating on it and it's just it, the whole entire thing is unbelievable um yeah oh definitely check that you. out I'll back after i watch it yep okay um yes please do yep uh so she's out of my league i gotta write these down um i'm writing them down if you need number two there's something about mary oh that's uh, on my list good one uh I mean, the bathroom Dude, scene where he's, get, where he's getting prepped. I, have. <laughs> I mean, I like the all timeness, and I can actually totally hear you in my head laughing to that movie. <laughs> Me? You, yeah. Yes, totally. Yes. Yes. I already know Daniel's favorite scene in that movie, and I didn't even know he liked that movie. I mean, I, I'm a 12 year old. <laughs> the hair scene. I already said, yeah, bathroom, the bathroom. Amazing. Hair scene, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. uh Dodie what do you got uh my number two is friends with benefits oh that is a good one it's Ashton Kutcher right and no, no that's another good one that's no strings attached friends with oh. benefits is with Justin Timberlake and uh Mila, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mila Kunis yeah. yeah 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 big fan haven't seen yes it. they do fla- have- like flash dancing is like a thing in the movie totally go to the thing and they dance and if the whole flat the whole group does it yeah Uh uh-huh such a good one and i love that is really i love everything about justin timberley oh same so yeah it's my number two all right i yeah i I circle that i gotta watch that (gasps) you've Uh, never seen it uh -uh. wait you'll you'll like it i'm gonna rewatch it too because i clearly haven't entangled with the other one in my head but that is a very good one Katie, uh, oh. your second and third pick. Okay, so I kind of wanted to change it, but I, I went right with my gut when um, you had asked the question. So I eat, pray, love. Okay, I've seen it. Oh, not impressed. No. No, eh. I mean, I feel like rom-coms are like really specific to you and your life and like where you're at and like what you find That's is fair. funny. What you find is funny, right? Like- yeah, yeah but Julia, right. That's Julia Roberts, though. Yeah, and she's like it's doing this like, searching. She which fa- I mean, she falls in love like, with herself. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank, Dodi, thank you. Yes, I, yeah, right. Beautiful. I, I think it's a great movie. I do want to rewatch it though. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll probably rewatch all these actually. <laughs> um, your last one. Oh, me. Okay, you're also gonna, I really feel like I kind of missed the mark on this whole question. Mar- <laughs> Marley and me? Oh, I mean... My dog's right here. I mean, like, yeah. Okay, I don't know. Well, you know, you know what? Maybe my humor was lacking when I, uh... <laughs> when I was choosing my movie picks. Marley uh, would be the saddest movie I've ever watched. <laughs> Oh, I mean, it is pretty sad. Okay, you're, t- you're taking the L on this for sure. I know. I, I, I you mean, know what? started with Firefly Lane. <laughs> I'll be emailing you later to okay. like, redeem myself if I can, you know, put in some other. When, it, <laughs> when, when we post it on our Instagram, um, you'll have to jump in the comments and, and add your, your updates. Oh, okay. Well, for oh. our listeners too, we actually send the question pre. Oh. Yeah, this isn't, this isn't spontaneous. <laughs> I tried to cut like, like, a list of I have a list of thirty movies. <laughs> I got like twelve. Yeah, totally. None of these were on it. None Out of your no, top hundred. They weren't this is my list. Oh, this no. is my list. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, well, enlighten me. I obviously need to educate myself on romantic comedies. Oh my goodness. Okay. It's my, my last turn. Um, how to lose a guy in 10 days. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I that's have that one. one. 
love it. Love everything about it. What What's your favorite part of that? You know what? I was thinking about that. I think it, it's a mix between them singing You're So Vain, because I sing that song all the time. Mm-hmm. So... Or at the, at the um, was it the Knicks game? When she is asking um, Benny Boy to go get food and stuff too, and then the uh, Knicks win on the buzzer beater and he missed it. Anyway, I thought that was hilarious. I mean, I just love that you knew it. Holy I love that movie. <laughs> I mean, oh. I could go on for 30 more. Can you please? I hope you share them with the rest of us. Well, yeah, you know what we should do is we'll put the rest of my list uh, in the show notes. A good one. Oh, perfect. It's a good idea. That's what we should do. Um, okay, my last one. I was just looking at my list. Like, I can't. I got. I got a bunch that are on here. Um, Crazy Stupid Love, Princess Bride, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Hey, you get one. You get one. You get one. Ten, I know. Ten things I hate about you. There's Sleepless in oh, Seattle. That's a, good, that's a one. good one. Um, you got mail. Yeah. But I'm gonna go yes, with Adam Sandler, the wedding singer. That was on my list too. Let's so go. <laughs> I just watched that literally last week. Yeah, I, I think I think it's like maybe one of his best that everybody sleeps on it. I mean, he's got a mullet, like those curls are just unbelievable. And everyone <laughs> thinks he's like the hottest guy ever, and he's really not. Drew Barrymore. Yeah um throwbacks too right those were from like high school college yeah yeah they're like they're like late 90s i think i yeah, mean vintage. i think but i like, won this i think talk, i won this talk about like 10 things i hate about you no i mentioned I, that i mentioned in my, in my little like honorable mention i mentioned 10 things i hate I, about you d kirks i thought for sure you were gonna say um wedding crashers no, that's a good one. She's out of my league, though. Is like, gosh, it's just so sneaky good. I, I, I mean, but Wedding Crashers has so many quotes too. Yeah, it is. But I mean, you know, who brought the good news bear, or who who brought the bad news bear? Somebody give her some fucking honey. I just think, I mean, that line. <laughs> there's so many. It's like, yeah, Kirkers. I don't know. It's just something about that movie just really just gets me going. I think it's awesome. I'm gonna have to watch it tonight. You know, so am I. I'm gonna watch it tonight. Let's all watch it tonight, and then let's 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 just follow up tomorrow about what we thought. I'll totally Love watch it. it tonight. I'm in. Um, so I Katie. won that one. No, <laughs> what? <laughs> I've never even heard of Friends with Benefits. I mean, get out of here. Watch it. It's it's like it's, it's the rom com. Okay, Katie definitely took a last with Fire I mean, you, you all could ask me to thank me. I maybe my whole my whole strategy was to make you all feel like wow. We kind of came out on top. <laughs> yeah, motivated. Psy- oh, the yeah. psychology. Um, we've run a lot, lot over time here, Katie. Thanks for your time. Glad we had you on the pod. Thanks for telling your story. Thanks for being vulnerable. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank awesome. you for having me. It was so fun. Oh my gosh, we could go on forever. So let's continue in another forum. Let's do it. Uh, we got to che- sure. cheers. Thanks for oh. being on the pod. Cheers. Thank you for having me.